Um, Watanara Yu is our keynote address speaker, and he has asked that you try to pay attention and not fall asleep. Okay. <laughs> Believe me, I'm not counting on that. Now, don't be shy. I'll try not to. <laughs> well, good morning. And welcome to LBCon! ready for a fabulous weekend. Uh, first off, I do want to give some special thanks to a couple of people who've worked incredibly hard, and she actually just went through this entire speech that I was planning on giving, so I won't have to go too much, but it was Rhea from Gillespie Tribe did a wonderful, wonderful job. Hey, okay, what's up? Sorry, I'm interrupting you totally. If anybody has children, your children are welcome to sit up front, and we can clear some of the chairs for some of the adults. That is possible, but... Sorry, yeah. go back to your thoughts. Any kids really want to get close to them? <laughs> I'm a bad influence. Okay, my name is Wasamata Yu, in case you hadn't figured that out. Well, it's not really Wasamata Yu, but uh, most of you know me by that name anyway. Weird, huh? At any other convention in America, if you were to open up with a line like, I'm with some out of you, they would probably think you were at a psychiatry seminar. <laughs> but us letterboxers, well, we're a breed apart. And as my wife said, we really should. Hold <laughs> <laughs> okay. on a second, I promised uh, Papaya and Dixie that I would Twitter to them and let them know how things were going. Really quick right here. Um, let's see, breed apart joke bombed. <laughs> All right. So, I haven't done this before in front of a big thing, so I'm really new to this. So how did we get here? And please don't say the metro. I mean, where did this hobby slash pastime slash compulsion start? How did we arrive at this stealthy, secretive, artistic endeavor? What are the origins of our shared obsession? And who really is responsible for making us who we are today? And is it too late to send him a bill? <laughs> these, these questions have caused a deep burning within me. Either that or was that norm food. <laughs> and I decided to do a little research into them. And so, without further ado, unless of course it really was the dorm food, I present to you Wasamata Yu's Boxers in Brief, letter History of Letterboxing. Now, conventional wisdom tells us, and since we are at the convention, it seems like a good place to start, is that letterboxing first appeared in 1854 in Dartmoor, England. But I want to tell you something. It actually has been around for a lot, lot longer than that. I can prove it. <laughs> for instance, the ancient Egyptians pr practiced a rather rudimentary form of letterboxing where they, wherein they would hide stamps and sealed containers. <laughs> Now, as we zoom in here a little bit more on the sarcophagus of the famous Tutankhamun, you can see vaguely some indications of early letterboxing technology. <laughs> now, the Egyptians at that time had not yet invented PZ Cut. Uh, that would come much later in 1512 uh, by Leonardo da Vinci Code. <laughs> and that, by the way, answers the age-old question as to why he wrote everything backwards. <laughs> um, so typically, <laughs> yeah, you might want to pay attention. <laughs> so typically, the stamps that the Egyptians used actually consisted of dead kings. So. Um, I do have actually uh, also some more proof of the Egyptian predilection for uh, uh, letterboxing and it can be found in their choice of hiding spots. <laughs> this is the Egyptian desert. Now, as seasoned letterboxers, let's see if you can find the suspicious pile of rocks. <laughs> Evidence of ancient letter boxes was uncovered in 1936 when an American boxer by the name with the trail name of Indiana 
successfully followed a particularly difficult set of map surfer clues. <laughs> now, as we zoom in, you can once again see evidence that this was, in fact, a letterbox. Wait, this is where I get to use my laser pointer. See, right here? Wait, let's zoom in a little bit more. Okay. And uh, one more thing to note, uh, of course, is that in ancient times, uh, they had a much more effective way of dealing with stolen stamps. <laughs> Over the next few thousand years, uh, letterboxing spread in pockets throughout the world. Well, actually, I guess when letterboxing spread in pockets, it's called cooties. <laughs> but I digress. Not much was written or remains of the early years. And letterboxing remained well hidden until the proverb, un, under the proverbial radar until the, until the year 1854. <laughs> 1854, the year Charles Dickens started writing Hard Times. The year the first telegraph line opened on Australia between Melbourne and Williamstown. The year of the first United States Naval Academy class graduated in Annapolis. 1854, which saw the births of Thomas Watson, George Eastman, and Engelbert Humperdinck. <laughs> not, not, no, no, not that one. Not, that Engelbert Humperdinck. It also saw the passing of George Ohm, Samuel Wilson, also known as Uncle Sam, and King Kamehameha III of Hawaii. 1854. In that year, a guide in Dartmoor, England, by the name of James Parrott, realized that unless something drastic was done very soon, 1854 would go down as one of the most boring years in history. <laughs> to bravely circumvent this dire international catastrophe, he cleverly placed a jar in a bog, thus single-handedly elevating the otherwise doomed year to world-changing status. A jar in a bog. This simple yet brilliant concept bears delving into, partly because it is so important to the foundations of what we do today, but mostly because I still have 15 minutes to go. <laughs> James Parrott was a tour guide in Dartmoor, in the country of Devon in England. This is Dartmoor. Now, think about it. It's a beautiful country and everything, no doubt, but look, a guide? <laughs> What's he gonna do? And on your left, we have some heather. In front of us, some more bog and a bit of heather. The intrepid Mr. Parrot had undoubtedly had a bit of time making ends meet, so he came up with an ingenious plan. He picked a spot in the middle of nowhere, Cranmere Pool. It had a nice little ghost story associated with it, so people had heard of the place. And by the way, if I have time afterwards, I will tell you the ghost story of Cranmere Pool. It's a great story. Uh, anyway, there's no actual pool here at Cranmere Pool, just as there is no actual crans or mirrors. Uh, and here is James Perrot's genius. He put a jar there. <laughs> a jar in a bog. The theory was that people could leave their cards in the jar to prove that they'd been there, and future visitors could see who else had made the arduous eight-mile trek to the jar. Soon followed that people would leave self-addressed postcards or letters in the jar so that the next visitor would collect them and mail them back to the original planters. Thus the origination of the term letterboxing. Now, isn't it nice to know that the worldwide phenomenon that we all hold so dear to our hearts was in fact a marketing scam? <laughs> I find that strangely comforting. <laughs> Over the next 144 years, letterboxing grew in the moors of England. <laughs> oh, wait. Wrong one, sorry. But still, it remained a secret to Pobby. That was until April of 1998, when Smithsonian Magazine published an article entitled, They Live and Breathe Letterboxing. This one article was ultimately the catalyst for the foundation of the American letterboxing. And I'm privileged actually to have an actual copy of this magazine uh, that I was presented by DMS. Thank you very much. Uh, and last year's wonderful living break. And 
and I do want to show you show this to you because it's one of my most prized possessions. So. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh. of North American letterboxing. Okay, this is where I have to tread very lightly because I could burn myself. Uh, there's people here in the room who were actually there during this part of the history of letterboxing, and I just want to make sure they don't drag me out behind the dorms tonight and probably me with their logbooks uh, if I say something wrong. So across the United States, several people saw the Smithsonian article, undoubtedly while sitting in their psychiatrist's waiting room, and got very excited. This part was probably due to an imbalance of medications. <laughs> but so be it. They each separately decided to try to encourage the foundation and growth of letterboxing in North America. And to this end, they contacted some of the leading dartboard letterboxing experts, Ray Ockot, Adrian Williams, and Graham Howard. They, in turn, passed the North, North Americans' names around to the other North Americans, ostensibly by putting them all in a hat, shaking it up, and setting it on fire. <laughs> and this, I believe, is how the early pioneers of LVNA first got in contact with each other. So who were these folks? Okay, bear with me. I'm not going to make any jokes for just a few moments here. Because from everything I've read, most of the early enthusiasts really do consider the true founders of North, North American letterboxing to be um, Eric and Susan Davis, uh, along with Daniel Cervadius. Yeah, big hand for that. Very sadly, uh, Eric, also known as the Viking of Vermont and on occasion the Fool on the Hill, has passed away and is no longer with us. But I can only hope that he would have been pleased with where his original vision and leadership had led us. There was another pioneer that came along around the same time. Something, someone who had been an avid rubber stamp carver for many years. This icon, or more accurately, an iconoplast, is here today. And his name is Colonel Mitch Klink, <laughs> also known as Darwiner Stamper. <laughs> oh, great. They're mad stamper. <laughs> He's back there, and uh, I strongly suggest you go back there and check out his goods. I, well, let me repeat <laughs> um, Just 
just go see it. Uh, DMS, as we uh, fondly refer to him, uh, got in touch with Daniel, who at that time put up a very rudimentary website devoted to the new pastime. Rather than get into a lot of details as to who contacted who and who did what and which people planted what where, suffice it to say that over the next few months, magic happened. A mailing list was formed, which eventually became the LVMA Big List, and DMS, in what was undoubtedly a pharmaceutically enhanced state, designed the LVNA website. Major players came pouring out into the new hobby, Tom Pooch, the Drew Clan, the ineffable, ma the ineffable map surfer, uh, Ray Record, and too many others to name. But by putting their mark, or if you'll pardon the inevitable pun, they left their stamp on our sport. <laughs> Letterboxing grew state by state and box by box, and with any, as with any group of creative characters, and letterboxers are, if nothing else, characters, <laughs> arguments ensued, disagreements unfolded, and differing opinions on to what was right or wrong sprang up. Sprung up. Boing. Sprang up. This was natural as the sport grew and evolved. The new boxers list was started by a guy with the unlikely name of Mark Peavy. <laughs> and then some other lettering boxing websites were formed, some which vanished and some which stuck like a wad of gluey gum to the bottom of a sleazy diner table. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of sleazy, <laughs> one day a young unemployed programmer decided there was a better way to search for letterboxes than the state and county listings in LBNA. Being completely unemployed and totally without employment, not having an active vocation to fall back on, he decided to make his own search engine, one that would allow us to focus in more exactly on what we were seeking. He spent a few months designing, testing, and refining, and eventually he hit upon an extremely clever and useful searching mechanism, one that was a damn right paradigm shifter, and one that would completely alter the way we did things for the better. This young man was, of course, Sergey Brin, founder of Google. <laughs> Oh, and in the meantime, some crackpot went to the name of Green Tortuga <laughs> developed something he called Atlas Quest. And it's funny, really. <laughs> they really both came around at the same time. And Google and AQ are really quite similar. Well, except for the fact that Sergey is a multi-billionaire, <laughs> head of one of the highest capitalized and most powerful corporations in the world, and Ryan, well, Ryan sells pencils. <laughs> Little pencils. <laughs> I know, I'm fired. <laughs> so really, there you have it. Um, as letterboxing continues to evolve and to grow and to expand, it does so because we are here to move it forward. As it is so often said, it is an obsession, a compulsion, and an addiction. But as my Uncle Don likes to also say, letterboxing is about the people. That rings true, at least it does for me. And I have to say that I'm grateful to the hobby for the many wonderful friendships I've made, the fantastic adventures I've had, and the places I would never have known existed. So once again, I want to say thank you to all my imaginary friends here, and welcome to LBCon! Thank you very much. I'm sorry about burning Okay, let's give him another round of applause. That was